Chapter five. From Rags to Riches. At the end of the day, I have to shield my eyes from the sun when I leave. There aren't any windows in the factory, only long electric strip lights. So it always seems really bright when you step outside, even just before sunset. It doesn't help that everything in the factory, apart from the multicolored boots, is gray or made grayish by a layer of dust. And it takes a minute for my eyes to adjust to all the colors of the street. The road outside the factory is always busy with scooters and cars. People keep their horns and beep them away for no reason at all. The air above the traffic is blurred by pollution and the distant skyscrapers sparkle and shimmer through the haze as though they're made of water. When the pollution gets really bad, the lights of the city form a, a kind of halo in the evening as though there are two setting suns, one in the west and one in the south. Even though Roshi lives to the north, near the slums, he walks back with me, weaving in and out of the masses of people going to and from work. Some of them crowd around stalls, scooping delicious street food into their mouths. The spicy, salty smell is enough to make me stop and breathe it in. But Roshi grabs my arm and pulls me along. We take a short cut down an alleyway and stop at the building where Ustin and Wododo live. Hey, Barker scum! I shouted the top floor window. We're ready for that rematch. Almost immediately, their mum puts her head out of the window. And from the expression on her face, I think she might be a Barcelona fan. Who do you think you are? She says, coming here and hollering abuse in the street. I should come down there and teach you some manners. She disappears, but is back at the window in an instant. We have to duck out of the way as a heavy vegetable root flies towards us. We're sorry, Ibu, Roshi says. We just want to know if Ustin and Wododo are there. No, she says. They must have been kept late. Now get going before I find something else to throw at you. Roshi and I walk away. Ustin and Wododo work at another factory with Fakri. Sometimes if the factory is behind, or has a big order, everyone has to work overtime to catch up. It's the same at the factory where Roshi and I work, although the foreman has a way of making sure everything is done on time. I might go home if the others aren't around, Roshi says. See you for the match tonight? I'll be there. Roshi turns down the next alley and I start dribbling a stone along the street, imagining that every passerby is a Valencia defender, trying to stop me as I race towards the goal. I'm almost home when I remember to stop at a stall to buy grandma's medicine and cigarettes. Then I carry on, kicking the stone into the center of the road and firing it into the littered doorway of the apartment building opposite. I make the shape of a heart with my fingers and pat my chest where the Real Madrid badge should be. When I get home, Grandma is asleep in her armchair, snoring quietly. Mum is cooking in the corner, and she looks over her shoulder as I walk into the room. Did you get the cigarettes and medicine? She asks. I lift up the blue plastic bag and put it on the table. Even though Mum has to shout over the sizzling vegetables in the pan, Grandma doesn't even wake up. This is another of her secrets for indestructibility. Sleep as much as you can. I know cats that don't sleep as much as Grandma. She can even sleep through the calls to prayer that blare out from a nearby mosque five times a day. Can you wake Grandma up? Mum says, stirring the vegetables. Dinner is almost ready and she needs to take her tablets. The best way to wake Grandma up is to shake her gently by the shoulder. She doesn't like it if you make a sudden loud noise or, or squirt water in her face or pinch her nose so she can't breathe. I've tried all those once before. Hmm. Wake up, Grandma, I whisper. Time for your tablets. Gradually, she lifts her head and blinks a few times. Hello, Booty, she says. Her breath is always really sour just after she's woken up. Is it that time already? Will you get them out of the packet for me? They're ever so fiddly. I fetch a cup of water and push two of the tablets out into Grandma's palm. 
Thank you. She gulps the tablets down and hands the cup back to me. Could you pass me a cigarette too? We're about to eat, Mum calls. Are you sure you want to smoke now? What are we having? Grandma asks. Just vegetables and rice. He can't really afford to buy meat until Elvis gets paid. Grandma shakes her head. Shouldn't he be at home by now? Yes, Mum says, scraping rice onto separate trays. But he said this morning the factory might be kept open for longer. Something about a new contract? Grandma is still shaking her head. He already works too much. Can't he turn the overtime down? Oh, I don't know, Mum says, topping the rice with vegetables. But we could really use the extra cash. That's if they pay him for it, Grandma says, rolling her eyes. Mum shrugs and carries the trays to the table. Boody, can you help Grandma, please? Grandma grips my wrist as she stands, and I guide her to the table. It's not as bad as watching Dad help her, because I can't really tell how hunched over she is, and I can feel the strength in her hands. We'll have to start without your father, Mum says as I sit down next to her. I'm sure he'll be back soon. But he still hasn't come home four hours later. His untouched tray of cold, wet vegetables and rice sits on the rickety table. Grandma is smoking her third cigarette since dinner in her armchair, and the room is hazy with smoke. Mum sews a button onto Dad's white shirt, but she keeps glancing at the empty doorway. I don't like not knowing where he is, she says. Oh, don't worry, Grandma says, exhaling two jets of smoke from her nostrils. He'll be at the factory. Grandma, I say, why do you smoke? She takes another drag and taps her cigarette over the chipped ashtray. Back when I started, they used to think smoking was good for you. Everyone I knew smoked, even though none of us could really afford it. And Elvis smoked too, the singer, I mean, not your father. He used to smoke cigars, but they've always been too expensive. So I smoke cigarettes instead. But doesn't smoking make your cough worse? Grandma blows a long cloud of smoke, like she's trying to whistle before crushing the cigarette in the ashtray. Yes, it does, she says. But I can't give up now. I'm too old to change. Grandma closes her eyes and rests her head against the back of the chair. Mum squints at the shirt across her lap, trying to sew in the dim light. Outside, scooters come and go constantly. That's the problem with living on an island, even one as big as Java. You can only go so far before you have to stop and turn back. That's why everyone here goes round in circles. Unless you own a boat as well. But there are so many islands in Indonesia that you'd probably just end up on another one driving around in circles again. Suddenly, Mum sighs loudly and lets the needle fall into her lap. Oh, it's no good, she says. I, I have to know what's going on. Woody, will you go down to the factory for me and tell your father to come home immediately? You can go to Roshi straight after. OK, I say, getting to my feet and heading for the door. And don't stay up too late, she calls after me. Remember, you have work to do in the morning. Outside, the air is really warm and still. Scooters using our street as a cut-through swerve around people and potholes. A little boy squats at the roadside, pushing litter into a burning pile with a stick and watching me as I pass. My nostrils sting with the smell of burning plastic. As I turn the corner, I almost walk straight into someone coming the opposite way. I recognize the yellow and blue checks instantly. Hello, son, Dad says. His face glistens with sweat and his damp shirt sticks to his chest. What are you doing out here? Mum sent me to look for you. She was getting worried. <laughs> I thought she might send a search party. We got a new order, so I had to work late. Uh, we must have made enough shirts for all the men in England. Dad wipes his face with the back of his hand. Anyway, let's go home. Your mother will be twice as worried now that you're out looking for me. Actually, I'm going to Roshi's to watch the game. Oh, yes, of course. 
Who are they playing tonight? Valencia. Any good? They're no match for Real Madrid. Kieran Wakefield will probably get a hat trick. Well, let's hope so. Have fun and say hello to Roshi's family for me. Dad squeezes my shoulder and sets off home. He walks slowly and the boy squatting by the roadside gets up and holds out his hand. Dad stops and shows his empty palms and the boy goes back to sorting through the rubbish with a stick. Roshi lives about 20 minutes away and by the time I get there, the roads are much quieter. Roshi's apartment is in the middle of a maze of narrow streets that people are always getting lost and robbed in. It's a good idea to walk with your pockets turned out so everyone can see you don't have anything to steal, even if you do look a bit silly. Sometimes I feel really sorry for Roshi because he, he has to share just one room with his mum and two older sisters. Imagine having two sisters. <laughs> What a nightmare. Luckily, they work as premolong, and everyone knows the best time to scavenge is late in the evening before the rats find anything worth eating. So Roshi doesn't have to put up with them too often. His mum is always at home though. She must be half grandma's age, but somehow she looks older. She never seems happy to see me, but Roshi tells me she never seems happy to see anyone. I think she's still sad about her husband dying even though it happened over a year ago. Back then, they used to live in a much bigger place because Roshi's dad was a successful salesman. Apparently, it even had a toilet, the type you sit on. But then his dad died and they had to move into a one-room apartment and Roshi had to leave school to come and work at the factory. At first, he was slow, unbelievably slow. Lazaro Celestino slow. I had to show him how to work faster, otherwise he would have been fired. I even gave him some of my uppers to make up his quota. The foreman was hard on him at first. For, he used to say, why do you work so slowly, Roshi? Aren't you used to working hard? Your problem is that you think you're better than everyone else because you've had an education. You've been living the easy life. Don't hold it like that, you idiot. Hold it like this. It's not a pencil, you moron. Watch Booty. He knows what he's doing. If you haven't improved by the end of the week, I'm kicking your ass out of here. Then where will you be? At first, Roshi didn't like me much, probably because the foreman kept telling him how slow he was compared to me. But Roshi is a really fast learner, and within a month, he was one of the best on the section. Then the foreman lost interest and found someone else to pick on. When I discovered Roshi used to play for his school football team, I invited him to play with me and Ustin and Fakhri and Widodo. And after that, he asked whether I wanted to watch the football at his apartment. Now we watch Real Madrid matches as often as we can, although sometimes his mum tells him he's not allowed to invite anyone over. And sometimes the illegal satellite dish on the roof doesn't work. When I arrive, Roshi's mum is already asleep on the mattress in the corner of the room. Roshi sits cross-legged on the floor in front of the television. There's a pile of pumpkin seed shells in front of him. And as I sit down, he offers me a handful of seeds. Is Kieran Wakefield on the squad list? I ask, chewing a seed and spitting out the shell. Yeah, they're just warming up now. I was only joking about him being injured. Roshi looks at me and grins. Even though Kieran Wakefield isn't his favorite player, I know that he knows Real Madrid are much better than Wakefield is on the pitch. On television, the camera focuses a lot on Kieran Wakefield warming up. He's wearing an orange bib and doing lots of drills. Even though I don't understand what the commentators are saying, I know they're talking about him. My heart beats faster whenever he sprints across the pitch. Is it supercharged, I ask. Roshi rolls his eyes. Well, I, I haven't touched it. When you switch a television on, the screen crackles and fuzzes and the glass gets buzzy with electricity. It's one of the best things about televisions. I wait until there's another close-up of Kieran Wakefield and then I put my hand against the glass. The tingles shoot through my fingers and spread up my arm. It's just like when you get a shock from touching a real person. Roshi shakes his head. 
but I know he doesn't mind really. If he didn't want me to do it, he'd just touch the screen before I arrived and steal the electricity. But he always leaves it for me. I can't wait, I say. Shh! In the corner of the room, Roshi's mum rolls over and mutters something sleepily. Luckily, she doesn't wake up. Because Spain is a long way from Indonesia, we can only watch matches at about midnight. This is probably because of how long the signal takes to reach us. Roshi tried to explain time zones to me once, but I couldn't concentrate because the football was on. We have to watch with the volume turned down really low so that we don't wake up Roshi's mum. It's also why we whisper and why he tells me to shut up a lot. What do you reckon the score will be, I whisper? 4-0. Belmonte will get a hat-trick and Wakefield will score one. Remember how good Wakefield was last week, I say. I still think Belmonte will score more than Wakefield. He doesn't like being upstaged. I don't agree with Roshi, but rather than get into an argument that might wake his mum, I split some more of the pumpkin seeds between my teeth. The football has been replaced by adverts for big shiny cars that I don't recognise and bottled soft drinks that I do. What are they saying? I ask. Roshi says that because he speaks a little bit of English, he can understand a little bit of Spanish. He says that most languages are pretty much the same. They're telling us to go out and buy that car. Why? Well, why what? Why do they want us to buy that car? They want you to buy it because they need to sell it. But what's so good about it? It's really spacious. See, you can fit everything in the back, a bicycle, a dog, your shopping, your kids. The joke is that you can fit so much into the car uh, that it's like having a second house. It's a car for people who have a lot of stuff. Roshi does say some strange things. Why would anyone need two houses? You can only be in one place at a time. Can't they just keep it all in their house or have less stuff? Roshi shrugs. Maybe, but they wouldn't sell many cars if the advert said that. Another advert comes on. This one shows a shiny car speeding around a racetrack. There are huge gray thunderclouds in the sky, just like during monsoon season. And when it starts raining, the tires splash through puddles in slow motion. Is this a car for people with less stuff? I ask. Well, I suppose so, Roshi says. You wouldn't get much in the back of that car. The car gets faster and faster and the operatic music gets louder and louder. Roshi gets up to turn the volume down. Who is the woman in the passenger seat, I ask. I don't know, Roshi says, sitting down beside me. No one? She looks like a movie star. She's very pretty. Another advert comes on. It's almost identical to the one before. Only the music and the colour of the car are different. Is that the same car, I ask? No, this is a different one. Roshi throws a handful of seeds into his mouth and wipes his hand on his shorts. Well, who is this one for? People who like to drive fast in the rain. Sounds like a bad idea to me. I is that the same woman who was in the other car, I asked. No, the other one had darker hair. So why do all these cars have women in the passenger seats? Do they come with the car? Roshi bursts out laughing, spraying seeds everywhere. He clamps a hand over his mouth and rolls around on the floor. His mum moans and turns over in her sleep again. Oh, what's so funny, I ask. I can feel my cheeks growing hot, that feeling like I'm bleeding on the inside. <laughs> you, Roshi says, you're funny. He gives me a playful nudge and shakes his head. But I suppose you're right. Maybe it should say, woman not included. He keeps giggling, trying to catch his breath. On the television, the man and woman sit side by side in the car. The crack down the middle of the screen makes it look as though there is a wall between them. Then the woman leans over, covering her red lips with a hand, and whispers something in the man's ear. The man's mouth turns up at the edges. He flexes his fingers and grips the steering wheel. The woman smiles directly at the camera. Then the car speeds off into the distance. Some adverts are really weird. 
Finally, the football comes back on. The players have finished warming up and the stands are filling with the luckiest people in the world. When they're old, they'll be able to say, I was there the day the greatest player in the world scored a hat-trick against Valencia. But at least I get to watch the game at Roshi's. Not long before the game starts, Roshi's sisters get home. I turn round when they mumble hello, but Roshi just grunts at the television. In the green glow of the screen, his sister's lips look black and their skin is a sickly yellow. I notice their arms are covered in scratches as they drop two sacks just inside the door. One of them takes something out of the smaller sack and sits next to her sister on the corner of the mattress. They start to eat. Oh, Buddy, Roshi says. This doesn't look good. I turn around and see the names of Real Madrid players arranged in formation on the screen. Noguera, Belmonte, Ocoa, Rubio, Tapia, Bello. Where's Kieran Wakefield? I look at the list of substitutes at the bottom of the screen, then I turn to Roshi. Where is Kieran Wakefield? I don't understand why he isn't in the team. We just watched him warm up. Roshi shrugs. I suddenly feel a bit sick. Why wouldn't he be in the team? Keep your voice down, Roshi says. I don't know why he's not playing. What are the commentators saying? I whisper. Although I think Roshi's family probably wouldn't mind if I started shouting. Kieran Wakefield is currently a missing person. Roshi leans in closer to the television, but eventually sits back and holds out his hands. I can't tell what they're saying, he says. They're talking too fast. And maybe he got injured in the warm-up, or, or maybe he got abducted by aliens. I don't know which would be worse. I just hope it's a mistake. But when the teams walk out onto the pitch, Kieran Wakefield is nowhere to be seen. All I can imagine is Kieran Wakefield being rushed to hospital or being abducted by aliens. It would make sense for the aliens to take care in Wakefield because he is the best footballer in the world and football is the most popular sport. If the aliens wanted a new player for their team, he would be the best choice. But whatever happened, this is terrible news, not just for me, but for Kieran Wakefield. Real Madrid and everyone who loves football. The only people who will be pleased are Valencia and their fans because now they don't have to worry about his ferocious pace and amazing skill. I worry about what will happen to Kieran Wakefield if he's injured. Once a boy at work named Bambang was so ill he couldn't work for a week, so he got fired. I asked Roshi whether Kieran Wakefield might get fired for not being able to play. Of course not, he whispers. It's pretty much impossible to sack a footballer. If Kieran Wakefield scored an own goal in every game, he would still get paid 360,000 euros a week. I frown at Roshi. Kieran Wakefield does not score own goals, but I'm also relieved. It would seem silly to pay 150 million euros for someone just to sack him. How much is 360,000 euros in rupia? I whisper. A lot. And how much is 150 million euros in rupia? Even more. Now shut up. The game's about to start. 360,000 euros doesn't seem like a lot, considering I get paid about 250,000 rupia a week. 150 million euros does seem like a lot, though, and it makes me wonder how much Real Madrid would pay to sign me. I'm not that bothered about the game now that Kieran Wakefield isn't playing. I watch a cockroach climb the wall and wonder whether only being interested when Kieran Wakefield plays makes me a glory supporter. I decide that it doesn't. About five minutes into the game, Valencia score. This is a disaster. Real Madrid are title contenders and Valencia are rubbish. This wouldn't be happening with Kieran Wakefield on the pitch. Luckily, we equalise about 15 minutes later. About 10 minutes after that, there is a power cut. Boy, this happens quite a lot. Once it happened at the factory and caused a big problem with the production line. The shoe cutting machine stopped working and no one could do their job. The foreman was angry because we were all just standing around not doing any work. 
He said we wouldn't get that day's wages, even though it wasn't our fault. Then the power came back on when Kurnia won and had his arm in the shoe cutter, trying to dislodge the material. Roshi and I sit in the dark, waiting for the power to come back on. We normally wait a while before giving up, even though they never fix power cuts at night. I can hear Roshi's steady breathing, and I ask whether he is still awake. Uh-huh, he grunts. Oh, oh, okay, good. Roshi, will Kieran Wakefield still get paid even though he's not playing? Oh, yeah, he'll still get paid. Footballers get paid for doing nothing most of the time. Oh, that's not true, I say. Shh, keep your voice down. And it is true. It's not, I whisper. First of all, it wouldn't be possible to play football all the time. You'd get tired after about two hours. Also, the scores would get too high and referees would need calculators, which are rare and expensive. Secondly, footballers train a lot, but people don't see it because they don't put it on television. I bet you could fill a bucket with the amount Kieran Wakefield sweats every day in training. Oh, that's disgusting, Roshi says. Thirdly, footballers have to play even in winter, outdoors, even if it's raining or snowing. In Spain, they have cold winters. So cold, you can see your breath and puddles turn to ice. Apparently, they're even worse in England, where Kieran Wakefield is from. I know where Kieran Wakefield is from. Fourthly, it's not easy being famous. You have to speak to loads of people who ask the same questions after every game when you just want to wash and go to bed. I'd love to be famous. I shake my head, but realize Roshi can't see me. So I sigh as well. Oh, everyone thinks that until they become famous and then they realize, oh, I mean, everyone thinks that until they become famous. And then they realize they can't go anywhere without someone asking for an autograph or taking a picture. Grandma said it was exactly the same for Elvis Presley. Being famous is not as much fun as it looks. Roshi doesn't argue. We sit in the dark in silence for another 10 minutes or so before I decide to leave. I turn my pockets out to make sure I don't get robbed and kick a stone along the deserted streets. When I get home, I collapse onto my mattress. Even though I'm exhausted, I lie awake worrying about what's happened to Kieran Wakefield. I try to tell myself that everything is fine, but all I can see is Kieran Wakefield hurtling into outer space and Real Madrid's title hopes vanishing with him.